Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm doing chapter 13 of numbers. Uh, and let's get started. So the chapter is split into four parts to convert strings to numbers uh, using the plier count and some numeric transformation and summaries. And usually they will use the two packages, Tidyverse and the New York City flight for 2013. So to we started with making numbers. Uh, you see that they usually collect numbers from a file, and usually numeric columns are usually expressed in integers or doubles when they are not in that where they are in decimal places. And in some unfortunate cases, they are sometimes in tags or we call them strings. So the read R package has this useful family of functions called the pass underscore star. These especially pass underscore integer and pass underscore double, is able to convert the strings into numeric. So in examples provided in the book here, it actually uh, turns all these texts into the numbers. I, I did ask this question before, what it, does it do with like special numerics in one of the previous book class? And it also turned them into the numbers and clearing all these uh, additional text as well. Uh, the next part is about deep plier count. And it, what it does is that it helps to count the number of observation in a certain group. So in this example here is from the New York flights data from 2013. And here are all the destinations that we have. And what this function count does is that it counts the number of times the flight is flying to that destination. So like, for example, this destination, it tries to arise 254 times and so on. So we can also have this additional parameters like sort and name so that we can number one, uh, name the columns to what what we want instead of just and we can name it to frequency and the sort equals true equals sort them from the most uh, common values so this is the highest one and then the bottom one will be from at the bottom will be at the bottom the same computation of deep plier account can be done in also in these three functions uh, when they use together. So what how is it done is that you first use a group by to group to tell that you want to group by the destination. Then you use the function summarize and you can have a deep plier n to indicate the count that we have. And because it's a summarize, we can also have additional columns to say other statistical summaries that we need. So all these uh, values here, like the 254 and 265, it's exactly the same as what we have in our previous two slides. So the plier n mentioned in the book is actually a special function because you can't really use it directly. You only can use it like inside a certain functions. Like they try to provide examples like mutate, filter, and group by. And here is like some documentations of how it actually does, but it's unfortunately like only have one example that I can find. But this is what I can do so far. Then there's another function called distinct, and underscore distinct that helps to count the number of unique values for one variable one or more variable. So in our case, we will group by the destinations again. And this time we want to count how many carriers are there for each destination. So what we put this uh the n underscore this thing and then I sort it by which what which uh destination has the most carriers. And then this is the results that we have like most carriers that the data set can have for one destination is up to seven. And here are the results for seven, yeah, for six, 
and so on and so forth. But none of them have zero, but at least most of them have at least one. <laughs> so they also cover about weighted counts and they said that weighted count is, is a sum and you can count like the number of miles the plane flew and you can instead of using like the group by summarize and you put a sum there you can use a additional function in the deep flyer count called wt to give a weighted count but honestly i find this less intuitive than this one so i guess it's just personal preference but in my personal take i actually find the one on the left like more intuitive to understand what you're trying to do and then uh, this is how we can count the number of missing values using is.na and sum function so using them together like this we can in this example here we can count the number of times the flame got cancelled where we have a departure time that has a missing value and we also try to group it by each destination so in this case here like the first destination in Q we have no cancelled flights so it's all zero and maybe A or B maybe it's tried, it has been like used more often it has like around 20 cancelled flights and so on and so forth So we go to the exercises. So the first, I just try to do them on my own and see how it goes. And for this exercise, we try to count the number of missing values for a given variable. So for this case, I just choose the variable called departure time. And then I filter the data, which those that has a uh, missing values. And then this is what I have. I thought I was thinking like, how can I find like the missing values for all the columns? But I know this is a bit like off like the chapter, but it's just for your information. Like I can do that like using the summarize and cross functions to go through every single column and count the missing values. And this is just to make it as in the longer term. So now I can know for each column how many missing how many missing values are there. So I know columns that have no missing values and columns with at least uh which color has a lot of missing values. Alternatively, uh across also if you can help to put like names of your columns and I just put the underscore and it counts so this additional function here helps me to add like like put the column name here and the underscore and it counts so I can like see the missing how many missing values each column has in a white format okay the next question was about to change the count into to use group by summarize and arrange and this is what I done so for this part here I just use a group by destination and then by summarize I this is the count so I just put the n plus the flyer uh, n function and then I arrange them by the uh from the highest to the lowest. So they, have, they both should be exactly the same. So here's another function, the form, but this time they use the weighted count. And we call from last time that weighted count is actually the sum. So I instead of, so I just replace it with the sum function instead. Then we go to the next session about arithmetic and recycling rules. So R handles like mismatch lens by recycling them. Like for this case, like even though there are four things in this numeric factor, if we just divide it by five, it thinks that you will divide by five for all the elements in the vector. 
So this is actually like similar to this part of the this line of code. And sometimes, but not all the time, warnings will be given. Like this is the case whereby the warnings are not provided. I'm sorry. Go back to here. So this is the case where the warning is not provided, whereby it goes and multiplied by 1 and 2 for this one, and it multiplies by 1 and 2 for the two groups. And then <laughs> here's a case where a warning is provided. So because of this recycling rule, it's good to be careful because sometimes, because the warning is not given, things could would not go, would go wrong sometimes. So in this case whereby we try to uh, filter by January and February. So we have two cases. One is to filter by using the percent, percent in <coughs> on the column man. And this is the one that has the mistake of putting the uh, double equal sign. So what happens is that if we see at the bottom here, we have a difference. One has like half of the variables that have been filtered and one has like all of them. So, <laughs> so what the book says is that the one with the double equal sign is actually like only filtering the odd number rows in January and the even numbers row in February. So, so we can see here like in the February case, it's only taking the odd number rows. And then when it comes to February, where the data starts from 129, it only takes the even rows. Yeah, so I think this part is just telling us that we just need to be a bit more careful on what we are trying to filter for. So the next part is about minimum and maximum. There's uh, some functions called the p min and the p max, and they say that's usually confused with just the mean and the max function. So the difference is that p min and p max takes the minimum and maximum of each row respectively. So in this case here, when the row is one and three, the minimum will just take one and the maximum will just take three because it's the maximum and the minimum for each row. And so the value changes for each row, supposedly. However, if we use like the mean value and the max value, it actually goes through the whole data set and picks the minimum value out of it. So that's why it gives all a value of one for this minimum color and the value of seven for the maximum color. We also have additional functions like these strange symbols. So one is to give an integer division and this is just to give the remainder. So what is it used for in this data set is that we can convert the departure time like this into hours and minutes. So for the hours, it uses an integer division. And for the minutes, it uses the remainder. Uh, it gets the it collects the remainder. So this is how it looks like. So it, it tries to use this like. It tries to apply this uh, hour, and then you can group them by hour and see the proportion and the total amount that has been cancelled. So um, it's just some examples here, like for each hour we have one for five, it's like nine has been cancelled out of 1,953 and it goes on. So, and it tries to remove the first one, which is they remove this row that departs because there's only one flight. 
and then it tries to plot them to this uh, chart over here where the x-axis is the hours and the y-axis is the proportion that is cancelled and we can see that cancellation they try to explain that the cancellations tends to accumulate increasing most the proportion has to increase until it's around 8 p.m where it starts to decrease because they say that the later flights tend to be less likely to have be, to be cancelled now this one is just about logarithms um how to use them but since it's not used in the data set so, uh, just skip this part and you can do them at your own time now this is the part of uh, rounding so round actually tries to round the number to the nearest integer and the second argument digits tends to turn it round to the nearest like digits indicated by the user so for this example here one the first example just uh, round it to the nearest integer which is one two three whereas if you put like a second the digit argument to be two it runs it runs off to the nearest two decimal places or if you want to be the just one decimal place it also accepts negative values so if you put like negative one it runs to like nearest 10 and minus two for the nearest 100. There are some cautions that it actually does a the round function in R does a banker's rounding. So what it does is that if you have a number that is halfway between two integers, like five, it will be rounded actually to the nearest even integers. So here are some examples is that see this 1.5 and 2.5, uh it actually got rounds up to to the nearest even integer and you can see here for the negative values it rounds off to negative two so it does this because you may want to keep the rounding um, bias to some extent so that half of the 0 0.5s get rounded up and half get rounded down however it's good to note that a uh, different programming language may use a different rounding system. So here's just a brief summary of, of what SAS did and sometimes uh, if someone runs an R and does a rounding function and someone does the same thing in SAS, we may have like different results. So uh, because like SAS actually does the normal rounding, uh, like in this case when it's 1.5, it goes up to 2 instead of uh, uh, sorry, for 2.5 case, it goes up to 3 if you use it in SARS, but in R, it goes down to 2. So you might have discrepancies in your results. So it is just a little uh, like slide to show that like, you can actually, like if you want to make them the same as SARS, there's like, some functions that could help you. And in SARS as well, you want to make it the same as R, there's also functions in SARS that could help you as well. So uh, back to rounding as a floor function and a ceiling function that takes like it always rounds up you see and floors always rounds down and you they don't have a digits function like round so what they do is that i'm not sure whether they i just quote this from the textbook but i don't it's maybe a bit hard to understand but what i guess it's trying to do is that it tries to like I don't know, like, I don't know what scale one and scale down is, but for me, it's, I think it's just like, putting like the same digits, like you divide and you multiply them to get the digits that you want. And there's another function called cut, but to me, cut is just like the base R version of case when, and when you split like your vectors into different groups. So in this case here, yeah, like you want to break this like numeric variable. So you can like, so from like zero to five, like this, this group here will be in this group zero to five and then five to 10 will be like, the 10 will be in 10 to 15 and then, the, uh, sorry, the 10 to 15, ah uh, yes. And then 
this is in, excuse me. So this is in the five and ten group. This will be in the ten to fifteen group, and this will be in the fifteen to twenty group. So you can also add like labels into the the cut function. So that's how why I say it kind of looks similar to the case when functions when you have numeric variable vectors that you want to classify them into different groups that may be in the form of a string. So in this case here, the x, yeah, I should have put this into here, this is clearer. So this in the case where we did this uh, 0, 5, 10, 15, 20 grouping, like this, we can actually add a text to it. So now, like it starts this numeric grouping, we have like grouping such as small, medium, large, and XL. And if it is outside the grouping, we, it actually gives a and a value as well. And you go through um, also some cumulative functions. Uh, that I'm not going to go through in detail. Like you can just take a look at them and see what it does. There's also another function called the slide, more complex uh, cumulative function called sliders package so what it does is that maybe some, some easier examples to see is that they have a slide function and this just tells you the underscore dbi just tells you it's returning a double but what you can see here is that even though it's from one to five and it takes like a cumulative mean but actually it's not really a cumulative mean because it only takes the mean of the current elements and the two elements before so it adds like certain flexibility to it so if you want to have like the mean of the first three numbers, for example, in your sequence, uh, maybe the slide pack, the sliders package may be something useful for you instead of writing your own functions for this. Okay, now we go back to some exercises. So this, the first one is just to provide some trigonomic functions. So in this R, we have trigonomic functions and they say that it uses radians instead of degrees. So we're not going to dwell too much on that. The second exercise uh, gives a problem whereby our, our timing is because it's in like the 24-hour system. Uh, there seems to be some like cut off values after it reaches sixty because after sixty it goes back to zero. So that's why there's some gaps between each hour. So it tells you to convert them into something that is more continuous. So what we do is that we use the integer division for the hours and the remainder function for the minutes and then I just turn that into fractions by dividing the minutes to 60 so that it's more continuous and the rest is just plotting the data so it looks it doesn't have any more gaps compared to this one where there's some gaps to here there's no more gaps. The next one is to convert the departure time and arrival time to the nearest five minutes. So what I have done is that I, because uh, round, uh, it, even though it has the digits function, it, it doesn't have, it couldn't convert it to nearest five minutes because it's not in decimal places. So I just apply them in, what we did the scale up and scale back up technique and somehow it, it works here yeah, so I just put a five and divide by five and times by five and somehow it, 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 it kind of works for all the numbers that I have here and yep and I I did apply the kit equals me so it keeps all the variables okay okay uh yeah, the next part is of the access of the book is to go through ranks. Uh ranks can be a bit confusing sometimes, depends on what 
applications you're doing. Like in this case, like you say that there's this function called the minimum rank. So it, the difference lies on how it deals with ties, like when you tie like this. So what it does is that it brings the ties to the same lowest position. So for first place will be first place. If you have a tie in second place, both will be second place. However, for the third place person, it will be brought down to the fourth place and so on. And it also has like a similar like base R function for it as well. We can also like sort them to give the largest values for the smallest rank in, in state. There are additional functions for ranking. For example, there's the row number that gives like a general one, two, three, four, five. There's a dense ranking that instead of giving like the fourth position for the person on third place in the event of there's a tie, it, it, puts, it puts a tree instead of a four. So that's what it means by it does not leave any gaps. There are also more complicated ranking system that I don't want to dwell too much about it because uh, I don't really know what is it used for at this point of time. But here are just some of the outputs that it gives out just for your information. So row numbers can be used, uh, they say without any arguments and like the end function in the deep flyer package, uh, it can be used inside like certain uh, functions like the mute or the summarize. Yeah. So here is like an example whereby it tries to group them based on the ID. So here's an example here is that if you want to create like one group for every tree every three every three uh person every three IDs we can use like uh integer functions like this here and you can group them like this like zero one two zero one two alternatively we can also use like the integer divisions to group them like this or we can just like do something more complicated in grouping using like the lead and the let function. So the let function, it, it just gives the same vector, but it goes like one step back if I put n equals to one. So it's like pushing it to the right and the lead function push the, the vectors to the left. So now it has one uh, n a state. So we can compare like we can use it to find like differences between previous and current values and to see what values have been changed. So this is where we try to find out, create more complicated groupings. So it tries to use, create a new group when uh, some event occur, in this case, when the difference between the current and the previous one is greater than five. So in this case, like here will be a new group and then over here as well will be a new group. And then this, um, you can first uh, calculate the difference. And then we have uh, like a Boolean uh, column to indicate uh, which one has like a difference greater than five. So we have encountered like two cases here. And then we can use the cum cumulative sum to group them together like this. So now like all those that have difference less than five, they are grouped into one group. And then when the difference is more than five, the value increases by one to say that they're in another group until the next value has the difference greater than five.
There's also another helpful function called consecutive IE that just gives a unique identifier for each time the value changes. So in this case here where we have A, A, A and when the value changed to B, it gives a 2. And when the value changed to a C, it provides a 3 and so on and so forth. Like even if it's the same value like A like has appeared before, it will provide a brand new like ID for it as well. Okay, we'll have some exercise on the ranking system. So the fight is the first one is to find the, the 10 most delayed flights using a ranking function. The 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 exercise didn't specify what kind of delay it is, but for me I'll just choose the delay in arrival. So this is picked by me, it's not picked by the exercise, it's just my choice. So what I did is that I use the arrival delay and I do a minimum rank and then I sort them from the most delay on the top. I yeah, and this one just brings the function to the this arrange just brings the ranking function to the front. Now, uh, and then this one just cuts to the first 10 rows. So I just only see 10 columns. So from here, we can see like the one with the most delay, the highest delay is uh, this flight here, which has uh, like around like a 12 hours delay, I think. Oh no, I think, uh, yeah, I think. It's a bit strange to have 72 in maybe uh <laughs> um not sure why uh it's like that uh, oops <laughs> but yeah I just try to like sort them by the delay and maybe I should have cleaned the flights function more thoroughly. Uh this one just tells you to get the tail number with the worst on time record. So I I don't know what we were on time here means, but for me I just use the arrival delay and those that has like arrival delay like greater than zero to be not on time. And I uh use like I count like the number of delays um uh, using the sum function. So I Yeah, so I for each tail number I count the number of delays and I rank them using the minimum rank function. So we can see here like which flight has the highest number of delays and has the hot worst on time record. The next one is to fly find out which day should you fly to avoid delays as much as possible. So I Kind of use like the same graph as before. Uh, instead, instead, and we can see that it's just better to um. Uh, yeah, instead of uh, sorry, uh, using arrival delay as the proportion, and usually to to avoid delays, it's best to fly in the very uh early timings like around 5 a.m. So as long as you take like very mo early morning flights to avoid delays. Okay. So the next part is to explain what this code does. And to the best of my abilities, it looks pretty complex, but I try to explain them line by line is we first group by the destination and then uh, we try to row number means that uh, to make it easier I create a group ID column called row number to see what exactly is it doing so this part here the filter row number is actually the same as this part here so what it does is that it labels them as one, two, three, like the earliest flights and then it takes like the first three flights that 
it has for each destination. So like for destination A, B, Q, it tries to take like the first three flights, like the earliest flight setting, or more like the first three flights in the data set, assuming that it's sorted by time. <laughs> So it's like the first three flights for destination A B Q, the first three flights for destination A C K, the first three flights for destination A L B N, so on. So the next one is again another explanation part whereby this time the row number is on departure delay instead of uh the row number is still being empty as now uh, has an additional column. So it's actually taking like it's actually like doing a labeling this time on the departure delay instead of the destination. So uh it tries to label like for me, I think what it's trying to do is it's trying to label like the three lowest departure delay flights because like I assume that they were sorted by time of which from lowest departure delay to the early to the largest one. So departure delays is it starts out with a negative value. So it takes like the three lowest values for each of the destinations. So yeah, yeah. So like for ABQ, like the lowest depart the three lowest departure delays are as follows. And here are the tail levels that are, have the least departure delay. So it does it for all the other three, all the other destinations. So this one is for each destination to compute the total number of delays. So that that one is uh Again, I I I really use the arrival delays. So I'm not really sure what whether we should use the departure delay, but for me, I just use the arrival delay for this question, and to take like the total number of delays, I just take the sum. But we have to take note that uh the arrival delays have negative values, so it may not be what we expect sometimes. So it's like, like some of them have negative values because it arrives. The plane actually arrives early. So actually like like for this destination, like it shows that like if you calculate the total reported negative values, like total delay is just negative values. So maybe I should have just used the absolute value instead, but I'm not sure how what's the best way to go to do this. <laughs> um wait. Oh yes, proportion of delay is just using like the mean in the sum and it's just using the mean, I guess. So that's proportion delay. So it's just like the total delay divided by n. Okay, so this one is to use the lag function to find some correlation in the departure delay. So the, the function is the 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 workflow is quite long, so I just try to go through step by step. Is that first I just compute the hours from the departure time into integers, and then I try to group them and group them by year, month, day, and hour. And then for each year, month, day, and hour, I get a departure, the mean departure delay. Yeah, the mean departure delay. And then I filter those with a uh, with those with a uh, at least five with at least five delays. So the lower should be at around six. And then I use the lag function to calculate the previous delay. So this the lag function here. And then I plot it into a graph to find if there's any correlations and it says that later flights are delayed to allow earlier flights to leave. So I just take a closer look at the plots here and this is the previous one, this is the current delay and this is the y equals to x line and you can see like if I do like a simple like linear regression it tends to go more upwards so it's kind of like 
if you have a delay in the previous one, you tend to have a longer delay in the next slide, which is kind of true what they say, that the later slides are kind of get delayed more and more, but hopefully not too much. Okay, this one is to try out slides that are fast. So I don't really know like what is mean by suspiciously fast. So I just search online and find out that is that the average flight is around <laughs> this miles per hour. And then I just filter the flights with this uh that are above this threshold. So what I did is that I calculate the hours and then I calculate like the miles and hours is like distance and hours to get the miles per hour and then I just get there like this and then just find out which which one has above 575 which I kind of forgot to filter them but at least I can arrange them to see which one are above 575 so it's so only like a couple of them but not too many. Okay, next one is about relative flights, uh, finding out what's the most delay. So for relative time, it's just taking the difference between the minimum air time and the current, the current air time, the minimum air time. So <laughs> yeah, so that's what I did for each destination and just put the tail number to see which flight has the longest delay. So this is just so the value at time is just the difference between these two values. And I managed to get the one with the the most delayed tail flights. So next one is to find all the destinations performed by at least two carriers and then use them to come up with some relative ranking. <laughs> so what I did is to group by the destination and then filter them by listing carriers that at least two. And this just me filtering the necessary columns. And then I try to get the arrival delay mean. And from the mean, I rank them. So for each destination and carrier that has at least two carriers, I try to get the mean and the rank. So because the N is around, it should around at least two. So there's no rank of one that I should have filter it as well, but it's okay. So we try to find those if at least. So I try to rank them a relative ranking. So I try to rank them in terms of the mean and this is what I managed to come up with. <laughs> I'm not really sure if it's the right answer, but this is what I managed to come up with. I think there may be some mistakes in this uh yeah, in this exercise here when I was doing it. Because now everybody has a rank of almost one and I don't really know why. <laughs> oh no no no, yeah, I have yeah for each carrier. Oh yeah, I managed to rank them. I just need to sort them out. So like for this like ATL destinations, maybe I should this ATL here. And then I managed to rank them by the earliest with the lowest arrival delay mean from one to three to the highest one. That's what ATL and yeah I think it's just that I yeah it's like this so Lowest delay, then at least two carriers. Right. OK, 
okay, next time we still go back to the center, we can find ways to summarize them. Like we can use medium, we can use the mean. They have something called quantiles as well to take like the 25th values of x that are greater than 25% of the value. And they say like 0 0.5 is the same as the median. So here's the case where we can look at the 95th quantile here. However, it's good to take note that in default in R, they use different algorithms to calculate quantiles. So the default is they use something called type 7. So if you look at type 7, you can see that actually there are like numerous ways to calculate quantiles. So because of this, it's also possible that if you use like, if someone use a different type in R, or someone use a different programming language that has a different default algorithm to calculate quantiles, there's a possibility that you can have different values between different programs as well. So it's the same as the rounding problem as well, whereby we could have different values in different softwares for C. So basically, if like if you have collaborating with someone using different softwares and they calculate like a different statistical summary, like. I mean, the same statistical summary, but with a different programming software. It's really good to check on the default functions because from my understanding, like quantile is used to calculate box plot as well. So if you are using like, you know, like plotting blocks, box plot on the same data set, but with a different software, you might end up having like different box plots, even though they are the same data from different softwares. So we have, the next part is have something called the spread, which is the using the standard deviation. And you also have something called the inter quartile range, which is also the quartile so between the this is the 75th percentage quartile and the 25th percentage quantile. But again, because the inter quartile range uses the quartile function, so it's possible also like for a different statistical software to give you different values of inter quartile range as well, because of the different algorithm we use to calculate the quantiles. Uh, we can besides we got through this before we can use distributions using like frequency polygons uh, I'm just not going to dwell too much on it and we can just refer to the textbook to see more information on how this can be done yeah so the last one is on the position where I first last and end which can be quite useful to give the extract values of certain position. So in this case where we want like the fifth, first, fifth, or the last departure for each day, we can like do a simple group by and then we use a summarize to get like and we can use like first, fifth, or the last to get the correct like timings or for me I use the departure time so I can get like the first departure, the fifth departure time, the last departure time for each of the days. And then this is how we can extract values that are complementary to their ranks. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, which is uh I just don't want to dwell too much time in this uh, because I'm going to get out of time soon. <laughs> Okay, this is I think the last part of the book, which is to calculate like different ways you can calculate numerical summaries using mutate. And this is just like a copy of what is provided in the textbook. So I don't dwell too much about it. So you know, back to the exercises. The first one is to brainstorm different ways to see different characteristics of groups of flights. Uh, Unfortunately, I wasn't really successful in this one to find anything interesting because when I try to do it for each of like, I just group it by the different origins and then I realized that most of them have the same distribution for Ding Pong in the New York City flights. So I'm not so like fortunate to find anything interesting in there. <laughs> The uh, second part is to find like, which one has the greatest variation in airspeed. So I use the same mouse per hour 
that I calculate previously and then I calculate the variance and I arrange them from the highest to the lowest. So these destinations have the highest variation in S B. And another question is to find like whether the airplane has moved location. So I will apologize if the figure is a bit small. So let me see if I can make it bigger. So what I realized then I look at the EGE, I was like trying to filter by destination EGE and I turned all my the distance from the flights to EGE for each of the distance and then I realized that like for January and February 2013 like the flights will consistently have a distance of 1726 for the starting point EWR and JFK uh, airport however for March April and December 2013 it has a slight increase of one instead of 1726 uh, they became 1725 and 1747 becomes 1746. So I think this is the, and it, the number seems to be quite consistent like throughout the later part of the years. So this is where I think that the flights actually could have moved the location. Okay, I think that's all for the exercise, and I think that should be it for most of the parts here. Yeah. So this is what the book has covered for numbers and they say like the next two chapters will be focusing more on strings and regular expressions and we'll see how it goes from there. So looking at the chat here, there's not much questions. Let me see if I miss out any questions. Okay, there's no questions. So. I think that's it. I think that's it.